St. Philip, my prayer is that everybody's doing well and that everybody and their family is taken care and walking in ultimately God's favor. These are our altar prayers for the week of January 23rd. Those people are Frida Minga in the transition of her aunt, 
Dr. Jamie Coleman Williams, Reverend Dr. Roy Jones and Angela Jones in the transition of their uncle, Agnes Kamara in the transition of her sister, Ty Smith and family in the transition of his brother, Helen Hinton, Reverend Mary Hayslett, Christina Hayslett, Richard Jenkins, Beatrice Burrell, Joseph and Freddie Phipps, the Hazard family, Dorothy Hunt, Gantry Habersham, Aura Hambrick, Mr. Theodore Gordon, Yerlene Gordon Jr., Victoria Hall, Leotha Cunningham, Jonathan Jones, Ollie James, Sarah Washington, Michael Spencer, Teresa Blackshear, Mary Copeland, Janelle Thompson, Paul Bacon, John Lewis, Mayo Jordan, Neil Lewis, Officer Jared Hunt, Dolores Curitan, Robert III, Karen and Kenia Curitan, Robert Jones, Doug Morris, Edna Rose, Miss Betty Benson, Miss Natty Lewis Moore, Miss Betty Griffin, Miss Estelle Warren, Kathy Seeley, Georgia Huff, Bobby Frost, Candace Sisko, Sharon Somerville, Brian Daly, Larry McKinney, Lily Adams, Raquan Roseboro, Rashad Neal, Pastor and Miss Wadley and family, Bishop Reginald Jackson and family, Presiding Elder Thomas DeGaulle and family, the Bidus, Biden and Harris administration, COVID-19 Delta variant and Omicron variant, everyone affected by those, criminal justice reform, Voting Rights Act, educational system and educators at all levels, historically black colleges and universities. These are the people and the items on our prayer list today. May we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you, first and foremost, God, for, for knowing, for being with us, God, and letting us know that all things that we bring to you, God, will be heard. God, you said in your word that if we lean on you, then you won't leave us. You told us in your word that you are a faithful God, and we believe it right now, God. We ask you to go by and touch each name, each family that we read on this list, oh God. You know what they need, the healing that they need, God, the peace that they may be looking for, the protection that they may need from you that only you can provide. We ask you, oh God, to answer these prayers in a way that only God can. We leave it at your feet, at the feet of the cross, oh God, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. And God, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for sending your angels to protect us day in and day out. We thank you for your guiding light. We thank you for your love that warms our hearts and affects how we treat one another. Now God, touch these people in a special way. Answer each and every one of their prayer, oh God. Hear them, comfort them console them in a way that only the maker of the universe can. This is our prayer, O oh God. We bless your name. And it is in that precious name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. We greet you again with the of the Lord, and we are grateful for this another opportunity to uh, study the word of God together. Let us pray. Into your presence we come, gracious God. Again, we are humbled, awed, and by your mercy and your
and your goodness to us. And so, God, we pray that as we study your word, that we will receive new insights for a living of these days from the sacred pages of the ages. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, today we look at Mark chapter 2 uh, from our theme from failure to fulfillment. Again, we remind you that the theme is based upon Mark's first uh, experiences with the faith in which he was not able to manifest the courage that was expected and required of him. But uh, rather than being thrown away, uh, Barnabas, some say was his uncle, took the time to mentor him to the point that Mark becomes a writer of the historic first gospel uh, that was the foundation for Matthew and Luke. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When he returned to Capernaum, that is the Lord Jesus, after some days it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that, that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door. And he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. When they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. Having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning there in their hearts. Why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. You can forgive sins but God alone. And once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves, and he said to them, Why do you raise such questions in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Stand up, take up your mat, your mat and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And immediately he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Um, it says that Jesus returned to Capernaum, and, um, and it was reported that he was at home. However, uh, as we know, Jesus was raised in uh, Nazareth. Nazareth was a town. Capernaum referred to uh, an area. And so, when it, and, and most of Jesus' ministry uh, was exercised in the area or region known as Capernaum. So when he went to Capernaum, uh, it was the place where uh, he uh, did most of his work and it was home territory for him. And when he uh, went there, um, the crowd gathered around the door and, and so that no one could get in. Now imagine that this paralytic uh, had been hearing about the works of Jesus and was excited and as his real true friends discussed of taking him can you imagine the excitement that uh, they had and uh, that was building every step they got to the uh, to the house just just with encouragement don't worry enough. In just a few more moments, you'll be walking like we all will. You'll be skipping and we can hang out together. Can't, can't you see the excitement of, of these few friends? And then they get there. And there is such a large crowd that they can't get to Jesus. 
the large crowd was unexpected, uh, but, but they did not allow the unexpected to get in their way. And I just want to remind all of us that if we want something badly enough, we cannot allow unexpected problems and hindrances to stop us or get in our way. Um, that that um, if we want something badly enough, we cannot allow people, proud is made up of people, to get in our way. Uh, and, 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 and you will always run across a different group of people uh, who will get in your way as you try to pursue the vision that, and your goal God has for your life and your own personal goals and dreams. The first, there are those who intentionally, for whatever the reason, will try to stop us. And then there will be those who have no malice or intent, but they still get in our way. That uh, they uh, do not offer encouraging language or sometimes they will stop us out of concern or hold us back. There is no malice or perhaps they just don't do all they could. But these persons, even though they do not have malice, can also get in our way. And, and when I've ever I've read this, passage, what struck me was that uh, no, no one offered to step aside and move out of the way for the paralyzed man. I mean that those on the edge of the crowd, they had to see him. Or why couldn't they say, excuse, you know, make room, make room, and as they made room, others perhaps would have made room. But uh, and it reminds us that we must be careful not to become so engrossed in our own agenda that we become immune to the needs of others who are more desperate than we are. Because as desperate as we are, there are those whose situation is even a greater. And, and, and I would also like to remind you that uh, no worthwhile goal is ever reached without having to overcome the unexpected. And, 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 and that the unexpected is often a sign of the greatness of the goal. Because great goals, great dreams are not reached without unexpected issues. And so, if you, uh, if you are having challenges reaching your goal and the vision and the dream that shows you that you are after something significant because easy goals are reached without problems, but great things. And so the, the difficulty, the amount of difficulty you are going through is evidence that you're trying for something great. And, 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 and so the unexpected is often a test of how much we really want to reach something. Because uh, if you just give up, you, you don't want it very badly. But, but if, if, if you really want something, then the unexpected is uh, a test to you of how much you really are after this. And, and, and so the unexpected then is also a measure of our faith that, that if we really believe, we really uh, will press our way. And, and, and that uh, if, if you immediately say, or, or soon say, no, I don't think we can do this. Uh, that, that, that shows your lack of faith. But if you continue to say, God showed this to me, I believe that God has given me gifts. And, and I believe the word of God and I trust God. 
even in the face of this great crowd. I, I, I believe we can do this. That shows great faith. And, and, and the unexpected is also a test of the loyalty and the support we have from our friend. Because the man was being carried by others. And even no matter how much he might have believed, they themselves had to believe and want uh, for them to try to come up with a way. And uh, um, none of us reaches great things, great dreams, no matter how gifted we are, no matter how much we believe by ourselves. And that's why it's critical that we associate with positive people. Because if you're always hanging out with people who are critical and who are quick to say of what can't be done and who are sowing doubts and who are not really believing, it's hard to overcome that and the unexpected. And so when the going gets tough, you will know who your friends and supporters really are. Many years ago, I think I might have told you about uh, a uh, developer in Philadelphia who had done a lot of development projects in the state of New Jersey. And, uh, but he was headquartered in Philadelphia and he had done some projects in Pennsylvania as well as New Jersey. And he ran into uh, some uh, challenges that caused his name to go out uh, to be printed in the papers and to be put on television and uh, social media. And um, I called him because I was familiar with the whole range of attacks that can come to you when you belong to God and you're pursuing great things and the consensus of the world is that you've gotten out of your place and some folk. And, and I told him, I said, uh, one of the things that's going to, you're going to learn when you walk through this situation, you're going to learn who your true friends are because your true friends are going to stick with you. Your true friends will continue to have faith in you. Your, two, your true friends will not be ashamed to be associated with you. And your true friends will go out of their way to do whatever they can. Your true friends will not be so engrossed in their own issues that they won't have time for you. So you're going to find out who your true friends are. And when you run across the unexpected, you will find out who your true friends are. And, I, and, I, and I've learned that uh, one of the reasons that the Lord allows the unexpected to come into our lives so that we can learn uh, who, are, <clears throat> who, are, <coughs> excuse me, who our true friends are is that when we come out on the other side, we will know who to bless because we will know beyond the shadow of a doubt who stuck with us, who prayed for us, and who stood up with us when the crowd uh, disappeared. And so the unexpected is a measure of the loyalty and of our supporters, and it's also a measure of the faith of our supporters in us and in our, uh, in our goals. The unexpected is also a measure of the risk to 
tolerance and ingenuity of our supporters. There's this term called risk tolerance when it talks about investments. Some investments have more risk than others. And when you invest, you have to know your risk tolerance. How much are you willing to risk for this particular, uh, in this particular investment? Uh, there was a time when one of the leading stocks now, Tesla was a risky investment. People wondered about these uh, electric cars, but now it is a major leading stock. Same thing can be said about Amazon. So many, uh, Disney, so many of the leading stocks were at one point risky. And folk did not uh, and they were considered to be um, not, not a sure company like some of the more stable stocks. But uh, in time, but, but, but for them to get to that point, uh, their supporters had to have risk tolerance. And you have to know how much risk tolerance you and your supporters have. And the, the unexpected is often a, a measure of, of the ingenuity so that his friend, we don't know who came up with the idea, whether it was the man or whether it was one of his friends about taking the roof off. Uh, but what no matter who came up with the idea, all of them were needed to participate in bringing it to pass. Yeah, yeah. And the unexpected um, is also a measure of our belief in Christ. They were trying to get to Jesus. What made them think that if they got to Jesus, he would be open and amenable and available to help them? Perhaps they, uh, they, 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 they believed his character based on what they had heard about him. And um, the risk tolerance says that what I know about Jesus, what I've read about Jesus, what I uh, feel about Jesus, what I believe about is causing me to go beyond what is easy and take some chances because I believe not simply in the healing power, I believe in the character because someone can have the means to help you and not help you. But, but, but we take a chance stretch out in faith on Jesus without knowing the outcome because we believe not simply that he has the power but that he has the character to use that power if he sees that we are in need of, of a miracle that only he can perform and uh, so they, they did what they do, did in terms of taking the roof off because uh, uh, they believed in his character, as did the woman with the issue of blood who said, uh, I believe in him so much that if I can touch the hem of the garment, the crowd's in the way, but, but if I can touch the hem of his garment, I believe I'll be made whole. That was why the ten lepers uh, called out to Jesus. They believed in his character enough that these 
rejected uh, people who were considered anathema in their culture. They believed so much in the character of Jesus that they were willing to call out to him. Z Zacchaeus said that there is some, has to be something about this Jesus uh, to the point that he was willing to climb a sycamore tree. This, this Zacchaeus was a tax collector that nobody uh, wanted to be around, uh, was, was willing to risk going out in the crowd and uh, climb a sycamore tree because he believed in the character of Jesus. And, and, and so did the woman in that passage found in Luke 7. Luke 7, verses 36 through 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house, took his place at the table. And a woman in the city, who was a sinner, sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster, joy of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. He said, a certain creditor had two debtors, one owed 500, let's say dollars, and another owed 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt for both of them. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears, dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss or greeting, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins which were many, have been forgiven. And she has shown great love, but the one to whom little love uh, is, but the one to whom little love is forgiven, loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who is even forgive sin? He said to the woman, your faith has saved you go in peace. Now, now that's a very touching sermon, but what I want to point is, is what made that woman believe that she could go into this house and uh, touch Jesus among all of these righteous people, that she, and that he would not expel her, that he would not dismiss her and condemn her and judge her. She believed in the character of Jesus. And, 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 and so we, 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 we strive for great things because we believe that even he not only has the power to bring us through, but he has a heart for us. His character, his spirit he is of such that he will use what he has to bring us through. And so, in this instance, 
he used his loving, the love in his purity, uh, moved him to say to her, your sins are forgiven. And when he was criticized for saying that, he just looked at her and said, go in peace. He didn't even take the time to uh, deal with people who were, he focused on her because his character is that he looks at us, sees our need, and is not concerned about what others may say because he sees within us and in us like they can never see. And so uh, they get up on the roof and it's not like their houses were not like ours. Roof was made of wood and straw and easily disposable material and they uh, made a hole. Now to do that required extra work, uh, it required uh, uh, them believing in the character of Jesus, and, and it required uh, them not listening to whatever questions people were raising when they saw them doing this. If faith will find a way, crowd was there. They looked up to the roof. And it's interesting that they look, had to look up to see the roof. They, they, they didn't try to push their way through. They didn't turn back. But in looking up, they saw a way. And that was the roof. Faith will find a way. Love will find a way. Determination will find a way. And uh, Jesus worked, and he, and, and, and he said to him, your sins are forgiven. Same thing he, uh, he, he used before. And when, and as before, when he uh, spoke a word of forgiveness for sins, uh, there were those in the crowd who were criticizing. Now, you know, um, if this was a crowd gathered to hear Jesus, you would have thought that it was a crowd that was friendly to Jesus. But even though uh, this was a crowd gathered to hear him, there were those who uh, did not believe in him. I'd just like to remind us that every crowd has hidden enemies. Just because people around us doesn't mean they're as uh, for us, so that every crowd has hidden enemies. And every crowd has curiosity seekers. Some people are there just to, not because they believe, not because they're hostile, but because they're just curious. Um, and some crowd has skeptics. Every crowd, all, every, you got you got hidden enemies, curiosity seekers, and skeptics. I, I, I preached a sermon many years ago that I heard an older preacher preach. Well, at that point he looked old. Uh, called There's Danger in a Crowd. It had to do with the fact that the crowd might do it again sometime. Uh, that was surrounding Jesus on the on on, on that first Palm Sunday. Uh, every crowd has hidden enemies, curiosity seekers, skeptics, but every crowd has believers. And that's where our focus ought to be, on the believers that are also present. Uh, those who are quick to criticize, as the Pharisees were, uh, which was the largest group of organized believers uh, are often insecure and afraid of losing power uh, because uh, if Jesus who was the opposite of much of what 
they claimed to believe and represent achieved popularity and notoriety. It was a threat to their power. Uh, we must never underestimate the power of the power drug. Hear that, the power of the power drug. The people who are uh, high and drugged up and living for power don't ever underestimate the hold of that power drug on them. And I would submit to you that the crisis in our country is due to the power of the power drug. Those who hold power are fearing to lose their power. That's a purpose behind the effort to restrict uh, voting rights because those who are in power, who are addicted to the power drug, are afraid of losing power. That's, that's the reason for much of the stronghold and delays in Congress. Those who have power are afraid of losing power. Uh, and so you have Republicans voting against uh, the Build Back Better initiative even when it is, it will bring advantages to their own districts that they re and states that they represent. That these states with, uh, that have great infrastructure problems, these great states that have a number of poor people, white as well as black, they will vote against the measures that will uh, strengthen their own constituency, that they will provide daycare for their own constituency, and, 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 and put money in the pocket of their own constituency, because they do not want to give political uh, power to a Democrat. And, and they so are so desperate to hold on to their power that they vote against the people who put them in office. Don't ever underestimate the power of the power drug. I never cease to be amazed how some Republican leaders can be publicly insulted and rejected by the demented and demonic 45th president. <coughs> but because they are uh, misled by the power that he has. And he has power with his following, but that following is not the majority. He was defeated by millions of voters but they will allow him to insult them, to reject their leadership, to talk about their family and still kiss up to him because they are so much in love with power. Um, uh, don't underestimate, no matter where it is, in national politics, in the church, in our fraternity, sorority, and uh, social organizations, in our community, and other kinds of movements. Don't underestimate the power of the power drug. One of my favorite uh, theologians whom you've heard me quote of the late Dr. Reinhold Niebuhr wrote a book called Moral Man in the Moral Society. And uh, the essence of that book was that, that sometimes 
organizations who become powerful and institutions become powerful sometimes if not forget about their mission put their mission to the side so that and they devote their attention to maintaining the institution because the institution represents power and those who are leaders rather than uh, being uh, focused on the goals, focus on keeping the institution that they have inherited in power. Don't underestimate the power of the power drug. Uh, and, 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 and so those who uh, who criticized Jesus when threatened by power. And, and, but they had no anointing, no ability to heal, no ability to solve problems. More often than not, those who criticize have no anointing to heal, no ability to solve problems. And so many of our, uh, in many of this nation's Republican leaders are rallying around a defeated president who has no real power to do anything uh, but criticize what's going on. Uh, we, um, and, and so they, uh, their assumption was that, uh, um, that it was sin that calls the uh, man and, and, and sometimes sin to, to be paralyzed. Sometimes sin can be the result of conditions. But sometimes problems occur, situations of crisis occur without any probable or inexplainable causes. And so if, uh, if people have losses, the reason may not be their mismanagement. It's just that sometimes life happens. But we also must remember this, that even when life happens and we cannot explain why some problems occur, all problems have answers. All problems have answers. All problems have answers. And, and, and our job is to keep focused on the Lord and asking Him to direct us toward the right answers. Our job is to keep working until we find the right answers. This pandemic has answers. This, no, no matter what the variant, there's an answer somewhere. Uh, when, when the pandemic first started, there, there were no uh, vaccines that were ready. But, but, but science had looked ahead and seen this as a probability or as a possibility. And because of the vacuum in political leadership at the time, what was a possibility became a probability, moved from possibility to probability to reality. But because they had been working on a vaccine, they were able to come up with one to address that variant. And that's a continued, they came up with a booster. And, uh, and now that other variants have emerged, they will continue, science will continue to work until uh, there is an answer. And I just need to say that to people of faith, uh, uh, that we must believe that any problem we face 
has an answer. And, and, and we cannot allow discussions of how stop us from working on solutions. So people will say, how are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? I don't see how this is going to be done. We cannot allow the how questions to stop us from working on the what questions. The what is, it says, this is what needs to happen. This is what needs to be done. This is what will solve the problem. We cannot allow the how question. I don't see how you're going to do this. Well, I have an answer. And, and, and this is what I'm going to do to solve the how. Yeah. And, and the Lord Jesus, uh, in his, uh, when he was attacked about saying, uh, telling the man that his sins were forgiven. He did not allow the sideline discussion to cause him to doubt himself. He knew who he was. He knew the power that he has. Uh, and and, and, and uh, he knew that he could solve this situation. And you cannot allow sideline discussion from those who have no power stop you from achieving uh, the, 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 the victory that God has placed within you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't get distracted because distraction is also a great instrument of the enemy. And so if I bring up this inane issue, if I talk about that, if I can get you focused over here, you will stop putting your attention to over there. And you will spend your time uh, focused on over here when that is the main issue. And there is a great uh, scene in Star Wars episode for a new hope where they are uh, uh, attacking the Death Star and a couple of their fighter pilots have been lost in battle and the, the leader of the group keeps saying, stay on target, stay on target, stay on target. I know you're hurt, but you cannot afford to take your eye off the prize. You have to stay on target. And uh, in Star Wars Episode Five, uh, The Force Awakens. Uh, what is it? Episode Yeah, Five. Yeah. Force. No. It's on Episode. Uh, sorry, excuse me. It's episode Seven. The Force Awakens, where one of the pilots uh, for the resistance is escaping and they have, they have commandeered a, uh, a, a ship to take him away. And, and they begin, and they have already dodged and struck down two of the weapons that were aimed after them. But as they were traveling, they got into the discussion about where they were going. And as they, the minute they just started arguing about where they were going to land, they got hit because they took their attention away from the enemy and placed it on another issue. I just need to say, we're going to, life does not give you one issue to focus on. You will always have a number of issues. But you got to keep your eye focused and your main energy. You deal with this. You deal with that. 
but you know where you're trying to go. You know what you're trying to do. You know the vision that God has given you. Greater than any vision you can have for yourself, others can have for you. And so that's where you keep your main focus. You've got to keep the main thing, the main thing. And too often, what has happened in the church and in our own lives is that we've allowed other things to become the main thing. Jesus never doubted himself, never took his attention off of the man who was in need of healing. And he does not allow sideline discussion to stop him from solving the problem and using his power to, to solve problems and interceding on our behalf. Let me remember, uh, uh, jump to the Gospel of John chapter 9 where Jesus heals a man who is born blind. And as usual, those who, um, who have no healing power begin to argue with the man that Jesus is not the prophet, that he says that he is and that he is really a sinner. And um, they said, uh, well, he's not this. And, 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 and he makes that great statement that we've heard, sinner or saint, sinner or not, I do not know this much I know. Whereas I was blind, now I see. And they became so resentful of him that, that, that they put him out of the synagogue. And because Jesus told a man to wash in the pool of Siloam, he left him was blind. He never got a chance to see Jesus because after he was not there, after he had obeyed the Lord's, uh, the Lord's word. And so he never saw Jesus. And so when they put him out, uh, he was there out by himself. And Jesus then came and introduced himself to him and helped him. Jesus never stops coming and interceding and equipping and empowering us when we reach those points in our lives where uh, we really need him. We not only need him to help solve the problem, we need him in the aftermath when we are attacked because of the favor of God that has come on our life, even then Jesus comes. And so in Luke chapter 9, after uh, they put him out of the temple, Jesus comes to him. I mean, John chapter 9. And um, Jesus says to him um, um, that, that, that uh, and introduces himself to him and lets him know it is he. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jesus heard uh, John chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and the one speaking to you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, those who do see may become blind. And then some of the Pharisees near him heard this, said to him, surely we are not blind, and all we, Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have not sinned. Now that you say we see your sin, Jesus comes to intercede for us when we press our claim and when we have uh, to face the consequences of our being blessed. And that's why he's such a savior. And that's why he's such a friend. And that's why it pays to serve Jesus. It pays every day. It pays 
every step of the way he is our very present help in a time of trouble. And that's why I enjoy introducing him to you and you to him. And so, if you have not yet received Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior, if you don't know for yourself who he is, what he can do, then it is my joy to enter, take this moment to introduce to you Jesus, the light and the life of the world. If you've not given your life to him, then uh, email us now at stphilip.org. Someone will lead you virtually in the prayer of salvation, or you can uh, uh, write the church or come by the church. One of our ministers will, have, will be happy to introduce you to Jesus. And, and, and if you need a church home, I, my joy as a pastor is to say to you, I'd love to be your pastor and help shepherd you into this next season of fulfillment, no matter what the past has been. God still has a future and a great vision for you. As a pastor and St. Philip as your church family, our, our mission and joy is to help you grow and glow into the fulfillment of what God sees for you. We we'll help pray you through and teach the Word of God that will help get you where God wants you to be. And if for whatever reason you left, and you have a move to come return home, I, we're not here to judge you, we're here to love you. Just email us, come by now, and, 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 and we will receive you again into the family of faith. And because he is such a great giver, and is such a great uh, lover, give so much. We give to him, not out of a spirit of obligation, but out of a spirit of thanksgiving. And faith that says, because you have given, I believe you're going to just keep on giving. So I will give above and beyond. I will give sacrificial because you, I follow your example of giving. And so, uh, you, you're invited to give. You may uh, mail your gifts to the church, St. Philip Henry Church, 240 Cannon Road, Canada, Atlanta, Georgia, 30317. You may bring them. Or you may use one of our giving platforms, online giving, Givelify, Cash App, PayPal, uh, text to give, or chaos. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, will be poured into your lap. That's the kind of Savior we serve. Well, it has been our joy to uh, study the Word of God and we look forward to seeing you again next week as we continue to walk through Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 2. Uh, we went through the first 12 verses today, and we'll begin with verse 13 next week. Uh, Gospel of Mark. God, we thank you now for your presence and your power. And we thank you for all that we have learned and felt as we've studied faithfully your word. Now, God, we pray that as we are in this session that the fire will still burn, the anointing oil will still flow, and the lessons we've learned will be a permanent fixture in our lives. In Jesus' name do we pray. Keep and cover all of those we love and hold dear.